Headline CPI rose by 5% in the month of May, which was actually the highest increase in inflation that we've seen since August of 2008. Despite that seemingly bad news, markets kind of brushed it aside and just continued on their uh, prior trend for the most part. The S&P 500 actually hit an all-time high here today, closed up by 0.47% and established a new intraday and closing price all-time high. We did see a little bit of selling in the Russell 2000, but all in all, uh, markets seem to handle that hot number in stride. So we'll take a look at all of that, see what it means for our posture. Then we'll get into our trade application example where I wanted to focus on a healthcare stock that seems to be bouncing up and off of an important support area. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Market Outlook video presented by MarketScholars.com. I'm your host, Brandon Van Zee. It's June 10th, 2021. First of all, if you're new, welcome aboard. Remember to go over to YouTube, click subscribe on our channel, then go down to our description area and sign up for our email distribution list. We're also heavy users of Twitter. Feel free to follow me if you're not doing so already. My handle is at Brandon Van Zee. And we really appreciate those of you that click like and retweet on those market outlook related tweets. Last but not least, we have a presence on Facebook. Feel free to join our group at that web address you see in the logo in front of you. All right, let's go ahead and jump into today's trade activity. And as you can see, I've got chart 4B pulled up here in front of us. And we like seeing that nice uh, green uh, label at the top of that chart there that says yearly high today and of course not just a yearly high but an all-time high now the S&P 500 was the only one that was able to accomplish that you can see the Dow Jones uh, still has its high back here on May 10th uh, the Russell 2000 actually has its high going all the way back to May 15th and the Nasdaq composite has its high on April 29th. So it is the S&P 500 that appears to be the leadership group of this market right now. And uh, I've got no, no, no problems with that, right? The, uh, uh, the most widely tracked benchmark on planet Earth in, in terms of um, stock indices is likely the S&P 500. So if you're gonna kind of pick one index to try to determine whether the markets on the whole are bullish or bearish, then we wanna see the S&P 500 uh, leading the way there. So impressive day for the S&P 500. You'll notice that the intermediate line is at 93 and rising. Now keep in mind, as long as it's above 80, it doesn't really matter if it's rising or falling. It's in this upper reversal zone, so we do consider that to have a strongly bullish posture. Remember, you can look at the background colors of these charts to help you uh, with your understanding of that as well. Um, and when we're looking at those uh, background colors um, and, and the, the readings that are, are coming off of that from a numbers perspective, notice how much higher the S&P 500 is compared to all the rest. The intermediate line on the Dow Jones is at 68, uh, Russell 2000 is at 89, and NASDAQ Composites at 75. So. Um, you know, you, you oftentimes don't see this type of separation between these four indices, but right now it, it truly is the S&P 500 that's uh, really exhibiting the, the, the excellent strength within this market. Now the Dow Jones, which for a period of time was our leader back here, kind of in the um, late April, early May time period, it was doing better than some of the other indices, but ever since topping out right there, we've kind of just been slogging sideways there. And you can see that due to a loss of some of our momentum, we're now uh, dealing with this weekly bearish posture here on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That's the only one out of the three, I'm sorry, the only one out of these four that we're looking at in front of us right now to have a weekly bearish posture. And remember, uh, that pink background color will help us identify that and it suggests that this green line is now positioned more bearishly. And you can see that uh, it was rising uh, and remember when it's rising between 20 and 80, we consider that to be bullish. So it was doing fine during this period, but then kind of stalled out here right around June 7th or so. We saw some of those candles giving back. In fact, uh, up until today, we had a three-day three, uh, three day, uh, losing streak that, that uh, was finally kicked to the curb today, but uh, it kind of did so with a whimper. You can see that we only finished higher on the Dow by 0.06%, and that's a long upper shadow that we're looking at on today's candle. So things looked a lot better earlier in the day for the Dow specifically, uh, and then it gave back the vast majority of its gains. S&P 500, sure, it didn't close at the high of its session, but it didn't give back very much along the way, and it still closed pretty 
um, firmly there. So I, I think that's a good sign there for the S&P 500. So anyway, be aware uh, that the Dow now has a uh, weekly bearish posture. Uh, moving on to the bottom two charts now, uh, S&P 500 was similar to the NASDAQ in that both of them uh, finished pretty strong. You can notice here with the NASDAQ composite, uh, we didn't quite close at the high of the day, but we were definitely in the upper half of the range there. And the NASDAQ did close higher by 0.78% today. So that was actually our strongest performer on a one day basis. Now, unlike the S&P 500, the NASDAQ's not quite to an all-time high yet. It would have to take out this candle from April 29th. We're not all that far away, but it's probably not going to happen in just one day. It would likely require uh, at least next week before we see that. And even then, it's still a bit of a question mark. Remember, the NASDAQ up until this past week hadn't really been humming quite along like it was in many parts of 2020. You can notice that the moving average, and this is the 30-day moving average we use here, is actually still tilted lower. So despite the, the NASDAQ having a nice run here recently, um, because it was doing so poorly back during this time period, when we count back the 30 days, um, we're still kind of dealing with some of these really struggling candles back here to kind of offset some of the more impressive ones that have happened here recently. But the net effect of those two things is still a slightly declining 30-day moving average. And so there might not be um, you know, as much of an ability to uh, have a further uptrend uh, if the NASDAQ does start testing some of those resistance areas up there, whereas the S&P 500, we've already taken out the resistance areas. So we've got blue skies ahead there. Now, it doesn't mean that the S&P 500 just goes straight up from here. Uh, anything can de derail a chart, which is why we look at these charts as often as we do during these daily videos. Uh, but all else being equal, the path of least resistance on the S&P 500 continues to be to the downside, whereas we can't necessarily make that case for the NASDAQ here at this point in time. And then um, last but not least, we do have the Russell 2000. This has kind of been an interesting one uh, to watch. Uh, I still have the bearish trade on for the Russell 2000 ETF. And I noticed that we're trading right between the strikes right now. I think it was the 228, 230 that I had done on the on the sold bear call spread. So with the, the two days pullback that we've had here, we're kind of back into that zone where maybe just maybe we'll, we'll be able to pull off a win. It, it'll be a tough one uh, without a doubt. And uh, as I mentioned, when we placed that trade, I, I, don't, I don't mind if we lose that trade. It was kind of a sacrificial lamb uh, knowing that the vast majority of trades that we put on recently are bullish trades. So if most of our trades are going up because the markets are bullish, I'm willing to sacrifice a, a bearish trade here or there. Uh, and that might very well be the case. But we've got about another week and a day left in that, in that particular trade there. So we'll see uh, what happens along the way. But after the last two days of pullback, it does look like maybe um, the, the, the Russell 2000 kind of got a, a little bit ahead of its skis there uh, in this really impressive move that I was not anticipating uh, up and through that moving average there. I figured it would um, be struggling below the moving average and it, it's proved me exactly wrong during that time period. And remember, that will happen if you're a trader. Uh, it's important to r remind yourself you'll never be perfect. Um, you'll do your best with the trades, with the information you have at the time, but um, there's going to be plenty of times where, where trades just don't work out uh, the way that you want, which is why it's important to position size properly. And in this case, we used a, a risk defined trade. So we know what our worst case scenario is, even if something moves against us. So anyway, um, back to, to put a, a finishing note on uh, the Russell 2000 index itself. Uh, it did close lower today by 0.68%. And with that pullback, it actually created a bullish intermediate confirmation signal. Notice down below kind of the formation of these lines. In particular, the bullish intermediate confirmation signal needs two of those three lines. It needs the green line and the red line. And what it, what it needs out of the green line is for it to either be pointing higher between 20 and 80 or just simply being in the upper reversal zone above 80, regardless of whether it's falling or rising. So as, this, as of this moment in time, it's at 89 and rising. So since it's above 80 in that upper reversal zone, we don't care if it's rising or falling, but in this case, it still happens to be rising, which is probably a little bit more bullish in that case. Um, so we know that our, our intermediate posture in this case is strongly bullish. We're now com combining that knowledge with the red line in the lower reversal zone. 
Now, unlike the first part of that conversation, where it's okay if we have the green line kind of between the goalposts heading in the right direction, here you cannot have the red line um, kind of going lower, like right here from um, June 2nd to June 3rd, that red line went down a little bit. In that case, it would not qualify for this particular setup. In this case, the red line has to be in the low reversal zone there. And it is, as you can see in this case, below 20. Um, it's uh, positioned right around nine at this moment in time. Now, as we've mentioned in the past, there are ways to identify more ideal setups and less ideal setups when it comes to the bullish intermediate confirmation signal. And typically what we're looking for uh, to help us identify that is, first of all, is the, is the red line at an extreme level? And what we kind of identify as an extreme level is below five. Right now with it at nine, it's not entering that extreme level. Sometimes when it gets too extreme, it gives you the sensation that it's about ready to take the whole market down with it. In this case, this is just kind of a normal breathe in and breathe out um, situation that we um, see unfold uh, on a regular basis. Remember, the red line is the most sensitive of all these lines. So they're gonna go up and down and up and down regularly from um, the lower reversal zone to the upper reversal zone and back again. Um, and so in this case, because it didn't go close to zero, it is below 20, but not below five. We still kind of view that as acceptable territory. Then the other thing that we tend to look for is the blue line. The blue line's technically not part of the bullish intermediate confirmation signal, but it is a way for us to kind of filter out what are better setups and what aren't. And what we're looking for there is for the blue line to be between 20 and 50. And you can see that is the case here. The blue line is at 37 at this moment in time. So it gives us the sense that this was a healthy enough of a pullback. In fact, this is kind of a probably a good example of this in motion. I didn't realize it until just now, but it looks like the Russell 2000 actually had a bullish intermediate confirmation signal yesterday as well, right? We sold off yesterday uh, and that red line came right down here to just below 20 there. It ended at like 15 yesterday. Um, but at the same time, the blue line was still up here at about 78. So yesterday would have been an example where you had the bullish intermediate confirmation signal, but it would not have been considered an ideal setup. With a second sell-off day like we have now, now you get the sense that there's actually been a legitimate exhale in this um, strongly bullish trend that we've established here more recently. So remember that the bullish intermediate confirmation signal is effectively a buy the dip signal. And you can now kind of see through what I've highlighted here how it would be more effective to buy the dip today as opposed to buying the dip yesterday. You get a better bang for your buck now, now that it's gone down an additional 0.68%. Now, whether that you know follows through with some sort of a bullish move from here on out is anybody's guess, but at least we know that signal exists there. So, you know, for those of you that were kind of sitting on the fence either way, maybe that information helps provide um, that guidance uh, in terms of chart reading that you were looking for. All right, let's go ahead and now take a look at our uh, three green arrow setup, and that will be chart uh, four. Where was it? 4D. There it is. Sometimes I lose my uh, track of, of where I'm at there. We've got over 50 customized charts that we offer those of you that are premium members. So sometimes it's hard to, to, pine, to, to, to pick out the one that I'm looking for. Anyway, this is a chart 4D and it is our three green arrows chart setup. The background colors of these charts will differ from the ones that I just looked at a moment ago. When we see a green background in this case, it means that these charts have what's known as a three green arrows signal. And that's just a colorful way to describe three different technical indicators that have bullish um, uh, tendencies at this moment in time. Doesn't guarantee anything about the future, but at least gives us a sense as to whether markets are more bullish or more bearish. And naturally, if we've got three green arrow signals, we probably have a little bit more bullishness in the system. And that's largely what we have right now. Uh, the only exception to that is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You'll know the Dow Jones uh, here does not have a green background behind today's candle. Notice it's white back there. And what that signifies, since it's not green and it's not pink, it means that it's a mix of green and red arrows. If it was pink back there, it would mean that we have a three red arrow signal. But when we have a kind of empty or white background like we do uh, in this case, it just means that we have some green and some red. And so let's kind of talk that through. We still have a green arrow on the 30-day moving average. So price is still above that moving average. Generally speaking, that's a bullish sign. But our culprit in this case is we now have a red arrow on the MACD histogram. Remember, the MACD histogram is a way for you to determine 
um, whether a security has momentum or not. It's a way to compare two different moving averages to one another uh, with kind of our, our signaling taking place from how the more sensitive moving average is comparing to the less sensitive moving average. And so it gives us a sense of you know, whether shorter term activity is pushing into or out of the security. And so now that we have this red arrow right here, it's giving us a sense that we have lost momentum on uh, the Dow Jones. Now this isn't a big deal because while we have lost the momentum that we once had when we were pushing to new highs, at the same time we haven't been breaking down below key support areas. So I kind of view this territory as no man's land. Uh, it's an area that is worth paying attention to and being aware of, but it's not necessarily a huge sell signal or anything along those lines. There still needs to be further evidence before you make a, a, a big bold uh, bet like that. Uh, and then on the stochastics, we continue to have the green arrow that's in place. Remember the green arrow is effectively measuring um, where we are closing um, in terms of previous trading ranges. And if we're closing near the highs of our previous trading ranges, then we would uh, have a greater chance to earn that green arrow. And that is still the case right here. If we start closing near the lows, then that indicator will turn around and it'll eventually produce a red arrow. And I would say that there's a pretty decent chance that you can see that on the Dow Jones here in the short term. Notice, first of all, that it's already rolled over and all it needs to do is go below 75 in this case. And right now it's sitting at like 78. And you'll notice up here that this is a security that is trading near the lows of the last four days worth of trading there. So this is not a security in the case of the Dow Jones Industrial Average where you're getting this um, you know, uh, this, this, this feel that market participants are trying to rush into it by buying it up into the close of the session. It's, it's kind of the opposite. If there is any bullishness throughout the sessions, you're kind of seeing the seller step in and pushing it near the lows of the day. So don't be surprised at all if we get a red arrow on the stochastics on the Dow Jones Industrial Average as soon as tomorrow. The good news is the other charts actually have quite a bit of leeway here on the stochastics. Notice uh, we actually see the stochastics continuing to rise on the S&P 500 and on um, the, the NASDAQ composite. Uh, we do have a little bit of a loss there or a rollover effect taking place on the Russell 2000, but I'm less concerned about that one than I am with the Dow because we've got a bit more wiggle room for it to kind of sort itself out. And if this is that bullish intermediate confirmation signal and we see a bounce up tomorrow on the Russell 2000, that might very well rectify that rolling over the stochastics that we're seeing there uh, as well. So it is the Dow that seems to be uh, the one that's kind of most at risk of, of seeing another uh, red arrow uh, be produced here in the short term. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over to the internet briefly. Always like to get a chance to say thank you uh, to those of you that help support this project. As I always say, as long as I'm getting at least 100 people clicking like for me on Twitter, I'm happy to do it. If we uh, get less than 100 likes on Twitter, uh, then I, I have to look at the rest of my schedule that day and, and try to determine whether it's worth my time uh, to do the, these free videos for you guys. Remember, we don't make a cent doing these videos. We don't you know, have any advertisers or uh, anything along those lines. So, so we do these on a volunteer basis, try to generate uh, exposure for our business, but uh, we don't ask you to pay for these videos at all. So naturally, uh, the only thing that we do ask you to do is help support us in social media and word of mouth advertising and all that kind of stuff. And as long as you guys do that on a fairly regular basis, we can justify taking two or three hours out of our day to produce these videos and edit them and send out the notifications and all that. But if you guys are unwilling to support us on social media, then you can understand where we don't really have an incentive to do the videos either. So uh, we'll leave it up to you guys. If you want us to continue to do these free videos for you, uh, we just simply ask you to click like for us there on Twitter. So I appreciate the 100 of you that did that for me on Tuesday, and I hope uh, many of you will do so again here today uh, on Thursday. Also, while we're over here, a reminder that uh, we had uh, a couple of, actually we had three different classes. I believe David did two of his uh, premium classes today because he was kind of rearranging his schedule. I know that I did my uh, premium question and answer session earlier today and you can see that boy oh boy did we have a lot to talk about here today. So uh, it was a long session, nearly three hours in length. Um, so uh, lots of different stuff uh, there, everything from you know, allocation percentages of the various uh, strategies that we teach to uh, thinking about um, looking at stocks that are cutting their dividends and when to know when to, to throw in the towel. Uh, we took a look at uh, Masco's business model. Uh, we took a look at a concept 
uh, of when a stock like Nvidia announces a 4 for 1 stock split, you know, what happens to the dividend under that scenario? Uh, we did an evaluation of Campbell's Soup now that that stock fell earlier this week to see if maybe there was an opportunity there for longer term investors. Uh, I got introduced to a couple of REITs that I had never heard of before, which is always fun. Sometimes when my students are asking me questions, I get to learn a few things along the way as well. So we took a look at Star REIT and Safe REIT, uh, which is kind of an innovative ground leasing uh, business model. And then uh, we also talked about um, some of the different order types out there like good till cancel extended orders. So if you're interested in any of that commentary, uh, if you're a premium member of Market Scholars, that recording has been posted to our calendar. Feel free to check that out. Also, while we're over here, let's take a peek at the Factor Selector. I put this together on Tuesday evenings um, and then post it to our website, typically on Wednesday mornings. And it kind of gives us a general sense as to how we're, 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 we're seeing things unfold in front of us from a factor perspective. Remember, factors are different than sectors. It's another way to kind of slice and dice the market. Uh, and it's what we use in my Wednesday morning class, which um, had the um, nice fortune this week where yesterday we uh, bought a bullish swing trade where we intended to hold it for three weeks. Well, good news is we rang that bell today. It hit our max profit target in one single day. So we always like that as swing traders if we can get out earlier uh, than uh, sticking around for the full three weeks. So great job to those of you that voted for that particular uh, security. And you should have seen that come through on Telegram earlier here today. Anyway, here on the factor selector, you can see that value is holding uh, the lead here for Pretty much um, the, the you know the 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 12th out of 13th time here in this rolling three month graphic that we are looking at, with the only exception being back here the final week of April it slipped down to number two, but very quickly the very next week went right back up to number one. So that's kind of the the same old same old story. Value continues to lead this market. Things like oil stocks, uh, banks, um, materials companies. Uh, those are some areas that have, have started to uh, you know, show some, some real benefit to those who have kind of taken a leap of faith on them after they had been kind of tossed to the side in 2020. On the downside, we do have a little bit of a shakeup where um, low volatility has uh, fallen to the bottom position there uh, on a relative basis doing worse than these other factors. It had been momentum for five weeks in a row, so it's a little bit new to see low volatility uh, down there once again. I know like uh, utilities have been kind of struggling on a relative basis. And so I think that's part of the story there. We've also seen a bit of a, of a bounce back with some of those growth oriented and momentum oriented companies. I know DocuSign as an example uh, did really well here last week. So that might have played a role in helping momentum kind of get off of that bottom slot. Whether it holds in coming weeks or not, we'll find out together. But we do know that there's that slight transition there uh, at the bottom. But um, for those of you that are looking for bullishness out there, it can continues to be value that is attracting a lot of attention. All right, let's get back on over here now to the thinkorswim charts and let's do some 12 grid analysis starting with chart 5A. This will be our asset class 12 grid and a reminder that the background colors will be either pink or uh, green. If they're pink, it means that they have a bearish intermediate posture according to the market forecast technical indicator and if the background colors are green, it means they have a bullish posture. And as you can see on this first set of 12 grids, we only have uh, three pink charts on the board. Uh, in the middle rung off to the right hand side is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, of course, has been in the news a lot here lately, both good and bad. I mean, it seems like uh, on, a, on a regular basis, you wake up, you check the headlines, and there's either something very noteworthy happening uh, to benefit Bitcoin or uh, as uh, maybe tossing it to the side, right? We had all the news with Elon Musk here a week or two ago. Uh, more recently, we heard, I think it was El Salvador, the, the country of El Salvador is now going to accept it as legal tender. Um, and so there's this constant tug of war that's taking place um, out there, it seems like, in the, in the cryptocurrency universe. Uh, what we know while, by looking at this chart is Bitcoin has struggled recently, right? It spilled over in a major way right here in the middle of May. And at that time, I was mentioning how, you know, 47,000, I think, was the number that I was, I was referencing at the time, basically the low of here and right here. Um, as long as we're staying below that, um, this is a chart that has turned out of favor and you've got to, you know, approach it very cautiously. Now remember, there can be times where a legitimate turnaround is at hand. 
And who knows, maybe we're getting closer to that moment in time for Bitcoin. So we know the momentum has certainly turned against Bitcoin. Now the question is, is there a chance for it to eventually rally again? Or is this, you know, tulips in our generation? In other words, um, you know, is it, uh, is it a bubble? Some people think it's worth nothing. Other people think Bitcoin's worth a million dollars a coin, right? And there's everybody in between. So it's, it's definitely a hot button issue. Um, and I don't think that the story is quite done yet, uh, regardless of your, whether you're wildly bullish or wildly bearish. Uh, as always, I would encourage you to keep an open mind to, to a, a variety of outcomes, and let's continue to read the charts as best we can. What we know is that we have one of these green dots appearing here a couple of days ago, and that's telling us that Bitcoin selling has gotten pretty extreme. We had one other instance of it over here, and it did stop going down. It actually went down the next day, but it closed close to where it closed the day it gave us the cluster. And it kind of held that line for a while. Then it went down a bit more and kind of broke another support level. But keep in mind that this other support level that it's at right now had some um, interest in that initial candle. Um, this low that it hit here two or three days ago did not breach the, the true low on an intraday basis of that candle there. So you kind of have a protected chart where you, you haven't gone to a new lower low on the last three months basis. And you also have an oversold cluster signal, which has led to a nice bounce here the last couple of days. Now the bounce hasn't been strong enough to actually change the posture. Remember the posture we're looking at here is an intermediate term. So it's not talking about, hey, what's it going to do tomorrow or next week? We're talking about, you know, an intermediate term, in other words, months. Um, and those types of charts need a while to kind of turn around, but at least we start our, we're starting to see some instances of maybe the bulls uh, stepping up here and taking advantage of cheaper prices. But until we start getting above this moving average and start getting kind of above some of these res resistance areas, um, you got to play it quite cautiously, right? These, this is not for the faint of heart. These are the types of assets that can go up and down 10% um, on a tweet uh, by the, the right or the wrong individual. So it's just a, a, a more dangerous game to play there for a lot of people. But at least we now see we still have a bearish posture on Bitcoin at this exact moment in time. But because of the oversold conditions, it is possible we get some sort of a reversion to the mean uh, rally as we start to try to establish some sort of a bottom. Um, the other charts that are pink are the US dollar in the lower left hand corner. We were down on the dollar today. It's really kind of struggling to get above that moving average. This has been a chart that we've talked about a lot in these presentations. This is one that has not been able to close above that moving average since going all the way back here to the first week of April effectively and uh, has stayed below there every single day along the way. You can see that it almost closed above it on uh, June 3rd, but didn't quite get there and then pulled back once again. And that's kind of where we were at earlier today. We went right up to the top of that moving average, but we couldn't close above it. So uh, the moving average stays red as a result of price continuing to be below a falling 30-day moving average. Um, this has been a uh, maybe a steadier bottom forming process that's taken place. Over here, this felt more like a free fall. We don't have that kind of behavior now. More, it's more sideways now. So I think there's a greater chance for the US dollar to make a move above that moving average than I would have figured over here. Back here, we were talking about the understanding that we had oversold cluster signals and we might get some reversion to the mean rally, but that would not change the trend. Now the story I think has changed a little bit where the chance of a trend change is a little bit more possible because it's not going down every day anymore. It's kind of stabilized a little bit better. So our next step would be to close above that moving average and hold that for at least a couple of days, if not a couple of weeks. And then at that point, if it's still holding, maybe a, a legitimate trend change could happen. Now remember, the US dollar impacts commodities. While the US dollar has been struggling, of course, gold prices and oil prices have been erupting higher. So with the dollar down today, no big surprise to see gold up and oil up. And both of those continue to have strongly bullish postures. Both of them are trading above rising 30-day moving averages. And so commodities are a strong beneficiary of some of this inflationary pressure that uh, we've been talking about so much in the economy here more recently. You'll notice that the third chart that is pink is the one in the right-hand corner. This is the 10-year treasury yield. So this is the interest rate. Um, you just move that decimal point over to the left one to read that. So effectively, the 10-year 
uh, Treasury interest rate is now at 1.45%, which is actually three month lows. Uh, I talked about that on, on Tuesday as well, that it was kind of in that vicinity. Today, I can say it's actually there. We are actually at three month lows on the US Treasury yield. And remember, that's a good thing for our purposes in this presentation, because we still have that bull put spread on with TLT, and it's looking almost assuredly like we're gonna take max gain on that trade because it expires uh, next week. So that is one that I'm glad we put on. Remember, it was not a conventional trade at the time. There wasn't a whole lot of people out there that were saying, boy, we should be long bonds in this environment uh, when I placed that trade. But I saw enough stabilization back there that I had that encouragement and I'm glad that I did. It, it looked a little dicey for a while, I'll admit. Here in the middle of, of May, I was starting to wonder, uh-oh, uh, is this one gonna turn against us? But it, it stabilized nicely and it did bounce higher. Now keep in mind, I am not bullish on the bond market for the long term. I recognize this as a short-term opportunity and I was willing to place a trade upon that theory, but uh, I am still somebody who, who would not be a big fan of holding bonds for the long term personally. I, I think that the, there are better opportunities within the stock market and perhaps even real estate and commodities, but I'm not a big bull on bonds long term. But I am glad to see them uh, holding up just fine here in the short term. Um, you can see that EFA had a, a tough day to day. It might have been as a result of the dividend payment. EFA continues to have a pretty stable upward trend right there. I would be curious if that set up a possible bullish intermediate confirmation signal. So let me check on that. I'm gonna right click on the chart and go to maximize sell. And we do, but notice this is not the idealized form. It almost is, um, but it's not quite there. And the reason for that is a reason that we don't often see. Most of the time when I say it's not the idealized form, it's because the blue line is above 50. Notice in this case, the blue line is still not between 50 and 20, so it's not an ideal setup, but it's because the blue line's already in the lower reversal zone. So it gives you the sense that this is maybe a bigger pullback than just your traditional exhale there. Now again, if that was as a result of um, a dividend payment that came out, maybe that needs to play a role because remember when a dividend gets paid out of an ETF like this, the share's price will go down by the amount of the dividend and then whatever organic trading activity would have happened beyond that. So that might be playing a bit of a role here, but uh, otherwise this is a bullish intermediate confirmation signal on EFA, it's just not one of the idealized form one. And you can kind of see that and the reason I, I that my, my gut was correct there by just looking at the chart, you, you kind of get a sense as to how those those um, those those signals um, will establish themselves on various charts. And this one was a dead ringer for that possibility. You can see it's still a stock that's in a strong uptrend, but it has had a pretty serious three-day correction that we've had here um, just this week. And so it seemed like it would be the type of chart that would be set up for that possibility. And indeed, that is the case. So keep your eye on EFA. I think there's still a lot to like about this chart. For those of you that are looking to reload the gun uh, and looking for other European assets, perhaps, remember Europe plays a big role in EFA, as does Japan and, and uh, Australia and others. But uh, maybe there's some opportunity out outside of the United States in this case. Let's take a look at what happened with the sectors here today. This will be chart 5C. And as these pull up here, we've got three pink charts on this set of 12 grids as well, and they're kind of huddled up in the middle. Uh, two of them were pink on uh, Tuesday as well, and those two are industrials and materials. I can't remember off the top of my head if, if Staples was also pink on Tuesday, but I do remember those two there, and I also remember discretionary was pink, so maybe that's a positive sign that in the two days since I was last with you, discretionary has gone from having a bearish posture to now having a bullish posture. However, I would temper your enthusiasm just a little bit in that case. We remain below a falling moving average on discretionary, so it's good that the posture changed, but we still have work to do on the chart. Even if it were to close slightly above that moving average, I don't think I would be, my, the issues in my head would be resolved until we were starting to trade above the highs of those two candles right there on uh, May 28th and June 1st. So we'll see if that can happen or not. We certainly have um, strength in the S&P 500 at large. So all else being equal, you should expect bullishness uh, to occur out there. But um, you know that is something that I wanna keep my eyes on in the middle, however. you know Materials had been a leadership area of this market and that's starting to break down a little bit. Remember, that's not necessarily a bad thing for the S&P 500. Materials is one of the smallest sectors out there. So on a market cap weighted basis, like we're looking at in this 12 grids view here, um, the, the S&P 500 is not gonna be taken down 
only by the materials. It has to have a lot of help. Remember, some of the bigger sectors out there are going to be technology, they're going to be discretionary, they're going to be communications and financials. Materials are part of those, those smaller groups that are out there that are not nearly as influential. So I hate to see this because there were so many good looking material setups for some of my other trend trading classes out there. But in terms of does this worry me about the overall market, the S&P 500, not really because it's kind of an afterthought type of a sector right there. Industrials are a little bit bigger, but they hadn't really um, kind of been a leadership group. They were kind of a middle of the group uh, category there, not necessarily you know in the top echelon the way that materials were. Um, and then staples, kind of like materials, is a smaller group, not one that could um, take out the market on its own. You'll notice that we have a lot of dark green colored charts. One of them that I pointed out um, on Tuesday, and I'll repeat again, is real estate. Real estate continues to impress me. Um, whether they deserve it or not is, is, is another question, but stock participants are sending real estate higher. And uh, we took a, a trade in the real estate uh, uh, sector in my Monday top-down trend trading class. So far, we're up on that trade. We'll see how long it goes. But it just goes to show you that the tide is changing. We, we haven't talked about real estate for a long, long time in terms of true market outperformance, but we're there now. Uh, it is happening right before our eyes here. So if you're looking for trends out there, uh, don't forget about that kind of wonky space of real estate investment trusts. Usually people that are interested in those types of securities are interested in the dividends, but uh, you know uh, those of you that are trend traders and could care less about dividends, um, that's an area of interest to you now all of a sudden as well. And then I also wanted to highlight uh, healthcare. Those of you that follow me on Twitter know that I try to update you throughout the day with things that I'm noticing within the marketplace. And one of the things I was tweeting about today was how I had noticed that health Healthcare was really, really strong. And I, I wasn't really looking at it through the uh, ETF of XLV. I was just looking at what stocks were leading the S&P 500 today. And at one point when I posted the tweet, nine out of the top 11 stocks in the S&P 500 were in the healthcare sector. So there was something a brew there. And remember, we've already been kind of pushed into the positive territory earlier this week when we got that fantastic news uh, from Biogen with their, uh, with their, with their Alzheimer's drug. Uh, I, for one, am thrilled by that, by the way. I uh, participate in a stock picking contest each year on Twitter, and uh, Biogen was the company that I selected uh, back in late December, knowing that they had their Alzheimer's uh, trial coming up. So that one move on Monday pushed me all the way into second place in that stock picking contest. So whether Biogen holds those levels or not uh, through the rest of the year until the, the, the contest wraps up is anybody's guess. But right now, I kind of like my chances on that one. Um, so we started the week with that really great news. And then yesterday, we had further positive news as a lot of the vaccine makers were shooting higher um, as we found out that the United States was going to be buying a whole bunch more vaccines and then distributing them throughout the rest of the world. Um, that happened, I think, on either Tuesday or, or perhaps yesterday on Wednesday. But the point is, there's a lot of positive vibes all of a sudden in healthcare. And uh, I had mentioned that you know during this time period, as it was bouncing up off of the moving average, that I was liking what I saw out of healthcare as we were heading into uh, ASCO, the big um, you know cancer drug convention that's taking place here um, here in the first part of June, where we get a lot more positive data there as well. And this chart didn't do as well. I, I was talking about healthcare and real estate at that time. I said both of those are kind of sneaky plays where there's bullishness coming into the system that it really isn't getting talked about a lot. And then of the two, real estate continued to work. So that one I had no issues with. Healthcare kind of rolled over there for a brief amount of time and actually crossed below that moving average. But it seems like those positive developments that we've had this week in healthcare are really shooting healthcare higher. And notice all of a sudden we are at multi-month highs on a closing basis on healthcare. We didn't quite get up and through that candle on the 21st on an intraday basis, but on a closing price basis, we're talking about multi-month highs. In fact, that might be all-time highs. Let me just check it real quick. Let's go back and just look at like a three-year chart here. Yeah, so we're looking at um, all-time highs here um, in closing basis, right? Again, intraday, there's a slightly higher high right there, but you can see where we're closing right now as opposed to where that candle closed right there. So uh, healthcare all of a sudden getting a nice shot in the arm, and that leads me to our trade application example here uh, for today. So for that, let me go ahead and pull up chart 3A, which is what I use for our swing trading class. 
And remember, this trade is already done. Uh, I've already posted uh, uh, the, the, the executed details of the trade to all of you that are premium members on Telegram. Remember, I do these trades during the trading day, uh, and then um, it gives you guys that are premium members of Market Scholars a benefit of knowledge uh, prior to everybody else who's just watching the video for free later on that night. So this is the trade that I did. It's uh, DaVita. Uh, this is a healthcare company that uh, excels in the dialysis space. And it was a company that really took off here after their earnings announcement back in late April. And you can see it topped out here around 129.59, and then has really struggled here over the last month or so. But we've started to stabilize here in the last week or so, and it's giving me a little bit more, um, you know, promise that it wants to actually. Um, change directions back to an uptrend, right? This has been a pretty difficult three-week period here for DaVita shareholders. But I like to see these setups when it starts stabilizing around that rising 30-day moving average. And so I just bought 100 shares of common stock, uh, and this is one of those one-for-one -one reward risk relationships. So I bought it a little bit earlier in the day, so we're up a little bit on it already. Um, but I like the fact that it closed above that rising moving average. Notice the moving average changed from yellow to green today as a result of closing back above that rising moving average. You can see the background color of the chart is now blue, whereas it was pink a couple of days ago. So that suggests we now have a bullish near-term posture, which is what we use for swing trading purposes. And I also like the fact that um, it's got a bit of a bullish divergent uh, type of a feel to it. Um, you can see the near-term line is what we use to identify um, those divergences. And you have this kind of trough right here that happened on um, June 8th, and then you had another trough that occurred right here on June 2nd. And this other trough right here, the more recent one, was higher than that one. So in other words, we saw improvement on the blue line when we associate this candle with that first point and this candle with that second point, we saw deterioration in the price action, yet improvement on the underlying indicator. So that's a bit of a bullish near-term divergence that's kind of helping us with this as well. So you can kind of see where my bands are in terms of the bracket order that I established for that particular trade setup. If you need exact uh, targets or exact stop loss areas, feel free to check the Telegram Alerts app where I've got all of that posted for those of you that are premium members. So that's what I had for you here today. We'll see if healthcare can continue to work in the near term, and if so, maybe uh, DaVita uh, will be a, a, an interesting choice for us here. So if you got value out of today's video about learning about all of these different uh, markets, whether it's uh, small caps or European stocks or Bitcoin or gold or oil or all of these other things that I talked about today, uh, or you just enjoyed uh, looking at the, the, the trade setup that I try to diligently hunt down for you guys during the day. The way that you let me know that you appreciate that is by clicking like for us there on Twitter. Uh, if you do so, I'll do my best to continue to, to offer these videos for you guys for free going forward. So with that, I want to wish you all the best of success with your trades and your investments. Goodbye for now.